Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Hi, my name is Stephanie Poon, and I'm going to be talking to you today about modernizing the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, otherwise known as HEFREF. These are my disclosures. Today, we will have three main objectives. First, I would like to highlight the importance of medical optimization for the management of patients with HEFREF. Next, I'll discuss some newer evidence-based strategies for the management of HEFREF. And finally, we'll examine some practical approaches to HEFREF management and show you how to put it all together. So let's start by talking about the importance of medical optimization. Recently, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Quality Indicators Working Group embarked on a collaboration with KaiHi to produce our first national heart failure quality report. We presented our findings at the Canadian Cardiovascular Congress last month, and our overall conclusions about the state of heart failure care in Canada were quite sobering. Our analysis of national level hospital discharge data obtained from 2009 and 2018 demonstrated that the 30 day heart failure readmission rate has remained static at approximately 20% over the past decade. Additionally, decompensated heart failure was the most common cause for readmission within 30 days. But perhaps most concerning of all, the total number of heart failure admissions has increased by 21.7% from 2009 to 2018 at a rate that is currently outpacing population growth. Now, this is a huge problem because the burden of heart failure in Canada is already quite high. Currently, we have over 650,000 Canadians living with heart failure. Heart failure is the second most common cause of hospitalization for anyone over the age of 65. And despite advances in medical therapy, mortality rates remain high. We also know that with each hospitalization, the risk of readmission increases and survival decreases as illustrated by this figure. Overall, it is estimated that heart failure will result in a direct cost of $2.8 billion per year to the Canadian healthcare system by the year 2030. So why do you think that the 30-day heart failure readmission rate has remained unchanged over the past decade? This is an audience polling question, so please take the time to log in the chat box what you think the correct answer might be. Your options are A, there have been no new advances in the management of heart failure from 2009 to 2018. B, there may be underutilization of evidence-based medical therapies. C, patients are non-adherent to medications. Or D, all of the above. I'll give you a few moments to log in your answers. Well, there have actually been a landslide of advances in heart failure management in the past decade. This is illustrated by the slide that I borrowed from Dr. Shelley Zeroth. We will be going over some of the more contemporary trials in a bit more detail later on, with a focus on the medications that are currently available in Canada due to time constraints. I'd like to add, though, that during this time frame, no less than eight consensus guidelines were published by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society to provide practicing clinicians with recommendations on how to optimize care for their patients with heart failure. Many of these guidelines emphasize the importance of ensuring that patients with HEFREF are an optimal medical therapy, and this figure illustrates why. We know for a fact that the more classes of heart failure medications we manage to get our patients on, the lower their overall mortality will be. However, studies have shown that despite these guidelines, patients with HEFREF are still receiving suboptimal care. Findings from the CHAMP HF registry drives this point home. This registry included US outpatients with chronic HEFREF. Despite the fact that less than 2% of contraindications to these medications, overall less than 75% of eligible patients were initiated on these therapies. Use of mineralocorticoid antagonists or MRAs and angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors or ARNIs was particularly low at 33% and 13% respectively. So certainly, this impresses upon us the need to use the first follow-up visit post-hospitalization and all subsequent outpatient clinic assessments as an opportunity to focus on optimization of guideline-directed medical therapies. So next, we'll talk about some of the landmark trials that have made big headlines in the treatment of HEFREF patients over the past few years. But before we get to these newer developments, let's take a look back at the 2017 algorithm for HEFREF management. 
At that time, our focus was on achieving triple therapy for HEFREF, which constituted beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and MRAs. Then came along Secubitrel Valsartan, which was shown to simultaneously promote the necrolysin pathway in addition to inhibiting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Secubitrel inhibits necrolysin and prevents it from degrading natriuretic peptides into inactive fragments. As a result, this leads to the promotion of beneficial downstream effects, including a decrease in blood pressure, sympathetic tone, fibrosis, hypertrophy, and an increase in diuresis. In Paradigm HF, 8,442 patients with MYHA class two to four symptoms and a left ventricular ejection fraction or LVEF of 40% or less were randomized to receive either secubitrel valsartan or enalapril in addition to recommended therapy. The primary outcome was a composite of death from cardiovascular causes or heart failure hospitalizations. As you can see, the patients randomized to the secubitrel valsartan group had a statistically significant reduction in the primary composite endpoint compared to the patients on enalapril. Additionally, RNAs outperformed ACE inhibitors and ARBs in terms of cardiac reverse remodeling indices with striking changes in LVEF, as shown in this figure, but also in left ventricular diameter and volume. These improvements of these indices were observed as early as at three months and became more significant with longer follow-up to 12 months. And this is really important because we know that LVEF is tied to a patient's overall prognosis. Specifically, if their LVEF remains lower than 35%, they will be more predisposed to sudden death, which is why these patients would then need an defibrillator for primary prevention. Therefore, it's in their best interest for us to try and optimize the medications, which will maximize their LVEF as much as possible, which is another argument for earlier upfront initiation of ARNIs. Now, let's shift gears a bit and talk about evabradine. Evabradine has a completely different mechanism of action from ARNIs. By temporarily blocking the funny channel in the sinus node, evabradine decreases the depolarization slope and is able to slow down the heart rate without affecting systole, thereby preserving contractility and increasing stroke volume. Now, why would a slower heart rate be desirable in our patients with HEFREF? Well, that's because we know that resting heart rate is directly related to mortality in patients with heart failure. Namely, a decrease of an initially increased heart rate is associated with improved mortality. As such, most clinicians will target a resting heart rate between 50 to 60 beats per minute or as low as tolerated. In the SHIFT trial, 6,505 patients with LVEF less than or equal to 35%, NYHA class two to four symptoms, a heart rate of at least 70 beats per minute in sinus rhythm on optomedical therapy were randomized to receive either evabradine or placebo. The median study duration was 23 months and the median heart rate was 77 beats per minute. This figure demonstrates that evabradine significantly decreased the primary endpoint of cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations by 18% on top of standard therapy. And these benefits appear early since the curves diverge at three months and become statistically significant at six months. Evabradine also reversed cardiac remodeling on top of recommended therapy within eight months, resulting in a reduction in left ventricular and systolic volume index and an increase in LVEF. Finally, there's been a lot of buzz recently about the SGLT2 inhibitors. Recently, two landmark trials were published in the New England Journal of Medicine regarding the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFREF, DAPA-HF, and Emperor Reduced. This is a table summarizing the two trials and the subtle differences between them. I'd like to point out that in both trials, about 50% of the patients did not have diabetes, and that Emperor Reduced used a slightly lower EGFR cutoff of 20 as opposed to 30 for DAPA-HF. The primary outcome in both trials was a composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization with the addition of urgent heart failure visits in DAPA-HF. Both of these trials demonstrated a statistically significant reduction in the primary outcome, which was consistent regardless of diabetes status, age, sex, or baseline use of ARNI. This figure shows us that the decrease in heart failure hospitalizations was actually the main driver of the statistically significant reduction in the primary endpoint. However, it also shows us 
that SGLT2 inhibitors may play an important role in renal protection as well. Based on all of these new clinical trials, we have now moved beyond our old concept of triple therapy to a new paradigm, as shown in this figure first presented by Dr. Carolyn Lamb. Now we recognize that there are likely at least five pathways activated in heart failure. And instead of triple therapy, the foundation of HEFREF medical management should now consist of quadruple therapy, which consists of RNAs, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. So, how do we put all of this theory into everyday clinical practice? Well, let's use a case to illustrate this. Mr. Winded is a 66-year-old gentleman with ischemic cardiomyopathy who we've been following for a very long time. His left ventricular ejection fraction has decreased from 37% to 25% on a most recent echocardiogram. He also has experienced a significant functional decline and now has NYJ class three symptoms. Current medications include bisoprolol 10 milligrams daily, pritopril 2 milligrams daily, spironolactone, and furosemide. On examination, blood pressure was 103 over 72, and pulse was regular at 78 beats per minute because he was in sinus rhythm. There was decreased air entry in his right lower lobe. JVP was elevated at his earlobe, but he had no peripheral edema. Blood work showed a sodium of 140, potassium 3.7, and creatinine 115. So what should we do now? Please take the time to log your answers into the chat box and we'll see. Your choices are A, we should increase his peripheral because he's only on two milligrams once daily. B, we should replace the peripheral with Sucubitril Valsartan. C, add Avabradine. D, add the SGLT2 inhibitor. E, all of the above are correct except A or F. Wow, all of this is way too overwhelming. There's too many choices on the slide. So take a few moments to see what we get in the chat box, and then we'll see what the most popular answer is. Well, uh, actually, all of these contemporary strategies would have been appropriate in this patient. You could have switched the ACE inhibitor to the ARNI, could have added an Aberdeen, or you could have even added an SGLT2 inhibitor. So all of those choices would have been correct. Now, remember that Secubitrol Valsartan is a replacement therapy for ACE inhibitors or ARBs and should not be used concurrently with these medications. If you are switching a patient from an ACE inhibitor to an ARNI, as in this case, remember that they will require a mandatory 36 hour washout period. That's one and a half days. The starting dose is either 24 slash 26 milligrams or 49 slash 51 milligrams DID. You can check their creatinine electrolytes in two to three weeks and watch their blood pressure. Use caution if their systolic blood pressure is less than 100 millimeters of mercury or their EGFR is less than 30. For Evabradine, consider using this if the patient is in sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 70 beats per minute or more, despite being a maximally tolerated dose of beta blocker. If the patient is over 75, you could consider starting Evabradine at 2.5 milligrams POBID. Otherwise, the starting dose is generally 5 milligrams BID and can be up titrated quickly to 7.5 milligrams BID as so the drug is generally very well tolerated. While Evabradine has no effect on blood pressure whatsoever, which is what's great about it, caution is advised if you're planning on starting it in patients with a systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Obviously, you should not use this if the patient is not in sinus rhythm because it won't be effective, or if the heart rate is less than 70 beats per minute already. Also, do not use Evabradine if the patient has severe cirrhosis. Finally, this is an algorithm for use of SGLT2 inhibitors that you can download from the Canadian Heart Failure Society website. Consider using SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with chronic HFREF with an EGFR that's at least 25. Caution is advised in patients who already have evidence of volume depletion, hypotension, active genital mycotic infections, or critical limb ischemia. You can start at either dipagliflozin or empagliflozin 10 milligrams daily, or if you prefer, canagliflozin 100 milligrams daily. If at subsequent visits a patient looks volume depleted, consider decreasing their diuretics. Also, make sure to follow up on their renal function. Additionally, we should ensure to counsel our patients on what to do on sick days, particularly when they are experiencing fever, vomiting, and or diarrhea. The mnemonic STADMANS is a good memory aid to help us remember which medications we should tell patients to stop 
when they're having a dehydrating illness. Finally, all comprehensive management strategies for heart failure patients should include non-pharmacologic interventions. We should ask them to restrict their sodium intake to less than 2,000 milligrams per day and recommend fluid restriction in selected patients. They should be taught to monitor their weights on a daily basis and how to adjust their diuretics according to these weights. We should highlight to them the importance of exercise, which will not only improve their quality of life, but will also assist them in achieving and maintaining a healthy body weight. Smoking cessation is paramount. Additionally, especially as we enter wave two of the COVID pandemic, we cannot stress enough the importance of obtaining the influenza vaccine, particularly in this high-risk population. And finally, close follow-up and disease management, and in particular, patient as well as caregiver education are critical to successful management of all heart failure patients. So in conclusion, the 30-day heart failure readmission rate has remained static at 20%, despite multiple advances in medical therapy during this time frame. A major contributing factor could be related to the underutilization of guideline-directed medical therapies by healthcare providers. We know that early optimization of medical therapy for HEFREF patients can lead to significant reductions in mortality and heart failure hospitalization. So it's absolutely critical that we do our part in ensuring that this is the case. Remember that the foundation of medical therapy for HEFREF currently consists of quadruple therapy, including ARNIs, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. If patients cannot afford ARNIs or are intolerant to them, you can start ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers instead. Hydralazine and nitrates can be used if patients are intolerant to ACE inhibitors or ARBs. If patients continue to have an elevated heart rate of more than 70 beats per minute in sinus rhythm on maximally tolerated beta blocker, Evaridine can be added. And finally, if patients have persistent symptoms, despite all of these medications and adequate diuresis, you can consider adding in digoxin. However, no management plan is complete without non-pharmacological interventions as well, which include lifestyle management advice, ongoing patient education, and a treatment plan that is tailored to individual patients with well-defined treatment goals. Because ultimately, I think that the key to slowing down this heart failure epidemic can be found in this quote by Benjamin Franklin. If we tell our patients things, they will certainly forget. If we teach them, they may remember, but it's only when we involve them in their own care that they will learn. It is my hope that by working all together and leveraging the phenomenal therapies that we currently have, we will be able to improve the outcomes for all of our patients living with heart failure in the decades to come. Thank you very much.